Hello everyone, my name is Alan Thorne and welcome to this 3D Motive video course. Here we'll be building modular environments in Blender that we'll end up importing into the Unity game engine to make expansive levels for our games. Let's take a look at the mesh environment here that we'll be making. I have this environment configured here in the Unity editor and it's ready for use in our game. Now at first sight it looks like one complete and integrated mesh. That's how it's supposed to look. But looks can be deceptive. Really this environment is composed from many smaller and independent pieces. They only look integrated because I've intentionally modelled them all to fit together seamlessly with each other like building blocks. In this course I'll show you how to make these kinds of environments effectively and how to import them optimally into Unity. Not only that, but I'll show you how to do it using tools that cost you and your business absolutely nothing. We'll see how to model and map environments in Blender, how to texture paint and prepare materials in GIMP, and then we'll import our meshes into Unity so they work with both the free and professional versions. So if you want to make game environments with infinite potential, then let's get started. Okay, so what I want to do ahead of time before we jump in and get modeling is to show you what we're going to be achieving in this course. So I'm here in Unity and I just want to show you the different level pieces that we're going to be making in this course so that uh, you know what we will achieve. So here I've gone ahead and just built a very basic and small level from the different pieces that we're going to be modeling. Now this looks like one complete and integrated environment but I've said already that actually it's made up from different independent pieces that we can fit together to really recombine in any way we want to create all kinds of different levels. So let's start having a look at the different pieces that we're going to be modeling. So right here I've got this floor piece that you can see here. So this is a square floor piece and this is tiled here here, here and here. Again we can rotate these pieces as much as we want and retile and combine them in different configurations. So I put this floor tile here. Now we've got another floor tile with this one here that we have, we've got that. That can connect up against any of the other tile pieces. You'll see that any of these floor tiles can connect with and recombine with any of the other floor tiles. We've also got a corner piece here, so you can see we've got that corner piece. And this is really just reflected over here in this corner piece. This is the same mesh, we've just mirrored it to fit to the other side. And the same for these other corners over here. We've also got some straight sections here, and we have some different variations. We have this straight section piece, and we have this straight section piece as well for the edges. And again, we can recombine these in any order we want. We can flip them and mirror them up against any of the other pieces. So in essence, these are the different pieces that we're going to be modeling. We've also got these outward corner pieces here, which will allow us to turn at the wall outwards to along corridor sections. So these are the different pieces that... So in this movie, I want to discuss the control scheme for Blender. And here I am at the Blender welcome screen. Now you can see from the welcome dialog that I'm using Blender 2.68a, which at the time of recording is the latest version. It may be that when you're watching this video, you may be using a later version. And if you are, that's okay. You will probably have a different image here, but otherwise the setup will be pretty much the same. So the very first time you start Blender, you'll have this interface with this color scheme here and this welcome dialog. And the, what I want to do here is to set the control scheme for Blender. Now you can see here in this interaction section, in this drop down list, we have a range of different control schemes that we can choose. We have the Blender control scheme, the 3ds Max scheme and the Maya scheme. These are really presets that configure the keyboard shortcuts you're going to be using and the general controls that you use to control Blender. Now I'm going to be using the Maya preset which will make the Blender controls mirror the Maya controls and the reason I'm doing that is because Unity uses the Maya style controls. So when working with Blender and Unity together I don't have to use two different control sets. I can use one control set throughout both applications and that really makes my work a lot easier. 
Now, if it just so happens that your Blender interface is over here like this and you don't have that welcome screen visible, you can easily get it to display again by coming up here to the toolbar, clicking on the Blender logo, and that will display the help screen again. And you can revisit that interaction dialog box and choose Maya to select the Maya style controls. An alternative way you can set the control scheme is through the user preferences dialog. And you can get access to that by choosing file and moving down to user preferences, or you can press control alt U on the keyboard. That will display the user preferences dialog. And you want to select the input tab here. And from the input tab, you want to make sure that the Maya preset is selected in this drop down list. And if you want to save that as your control scheme, your default scheme, if you want to make that a permanent fixture, then you want to click on the Save User Settings button here, and that will go ahead and make those settings permanent so that every time you restart Blender, you'll be using the Maya style controls. Of course, if you actually want to come in and start configuring and customizing the controls even further, you can use these options in here to come in and set the controls to be whatever you want. But I'm going to leave the Maya style controls at their defaults and just exit the user preferences. And that's how we go ahead and set up the Maya style controls for Blender. Now I want to discuss the Blender user interface. Now many people are perfectly happy with the default theme and color scheme of the Blender interface, but I personally like my color scheme to be a bit darker. Right now you can see that the panels of the user interface are this mid-tone kind of gray, and that's a bit too bright for my taste. I prefer to darken it up a little bit. And I also like some of the objects in the scene to appear a little bit differently. For example, here I've got this cube. This is the default scene in Blender. Now I'm just going to select that cube in the viewport. And right now we're in object mode. But if I want to have a look at the vertices of this, I have to enter edit mode. Some applications call this sub-object mode or component mode, but Blender calls it edit mode. If I press tab on the keyboard, you can see here that we enter edit mode and I can now access the vertices, edges, and faces of this object. And I like my vertices to appear a little bit larger than they do right now. So I'm gonna start tweaking these settings, and to do that, I can move up to the User Preferences menu. I'll choose File, User Preferences, and this brings up the User Preferences dialog, and already I'm on the Themes tab, and I want to customize how this theme appears. Now, I want to select a different theme. So I can choose the presets here. And for example, I could choose back to black. And that really turns my interface really very dark indeed. And I don't like my interface quite that dark. There's the Blender 24X, this theme here. There's hexagon, Ubuntu ambience. But I'm going to choose the Elsian theme here, which is the middle option. And that's the kind of interface that I like in terms of darkness. So I think that's looking pretty good, but I also want to change how large the vertices in my viewport appear here. So I'm going to customize the 3D view, and you can see, let's just move this over into the screen a bit better and scroll down just a little bit here. And you can see that here we've got vertex size, and right now it's a size of three, if I just move this over a little bit and start to increase the size, you can see in the viewport my vertices are increasing. And I think perhaps a size of six is about what I need. If I ever need to change them, of course, I can just come back in and change them. So I'm going to accept these settings as they are and just choose Save User Settings. And I'm just going to exit this dialog. And I'm happy with these settings. And there I've customized the Blender interface to be just how I like it. So now we're almost ready to get started. There's just one more thing that I want to do regarding the Blender interface. In this course, we're going to be doing a lot of modeling, a lot of UV mapping and texture work. But one thing we will not be doing is animation. Now you can see that in the default Blender user interface arrangement, we have this bottom part of the screen here, which is dedicated to animation. You can see the timeline here and some animation controls. We're never going to be using those controls at all, and I like to have as much screen space and real estate as I can. Now you can see up here in the toolbar that we have different user interface arrangements. Right now we're in the default arrangement. You can click on this button here to see the presets. 
We have the default arrangement, we have a compositing layout, we also have an animation layout, and we have a video editing layout. We've got a whole video sequencer here, and we've got uh, the UV editing layout for defining the UV mapping of an object. Let's just go back to the default layout. But in this default layout, we've got this animation toolbar that we're never going to use, and I want to get rid of it completely so I get as much screen space as possible. So I'm going to create my, new, my own custom layout, really. And to do that, I'm going to choose this plus icon here, and I'm going to give this layout a name of modeling because we're going to be modeling in this layout. So I'll just accept that here. And now whenever I make a change to the user interface, it's going to be recorded into this modeling layout here. So I want to get rid of this animation toolbar completely. And to do that, I move over here to this, the bottom left part of the 3D view. You can see here we've got this whole border which marks out the 3D view. And it's represented here by this 3D view preset. Now I want to click on the little diagonal arrows in that 3D view. Click and hold the mouse button and pull down into the animation timeline. And you'll see that when I do that, you get this arrow icon appear in the center here. And when that appears, I want to release my mouse. And now that section, that whole animation window completely disappears. And now we've got this modeling screen, the 3D view completely full screen here and that is what I want. So now if I come out into any other view and I return back to the modeling preset, we've got our interface exactly how we want it. So now it's configured and ready for modeling. All I need to do now is just save my file by choosing File, Save, and I can save my file to whatever I like, and these user interface presets are saved with my file. So now we're good to go. Okay, so now let's get started at creating our modular environment assets. I have a default Blender scene open in front of me here that I've saved, and we're here in the modeling user interface preset that we have created. We've got a, a nice lot of screen space here that we can use. Now to get started at creating the modular environments, really we need to think about every single one of the pieces in the set as being a tile, a tile in a grid, and we create the modular set by just piecing together the different tiles. Now, if we think about it like that, you can see that if the tiles are going to match up and all fit together nicely, then they all need to be exactly the same size as each other, or they need to be multiples of the same size. And so that's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to use this cube as our kind of base tile, the starting point from which we're going to make all of the environment pieces. So what I want to do here is to position and size this tile appropriately so that everything else can be made to fit with it and it will match up. So right now I want to just position this cube. We always want to model at the world origin and this cube right now is positioned at the world origin but you can see that the pivot point of this cube is right at the center of this cube here and actually I don't want that. I want the pivot point to be down here at the center of the floor. Now I can change this by just uh, dragging on the gizmo up axis and moving the cube here, but notice that it moves in a continuous way. It doesn't snap nicely to the grid. It's not going to fit nicely to the grid floor if we do it this way. So I'm going to press Ctrl Z to undo it. I want to activate the snapping feature of Blender. And in this course, we're going to be using a snapping a lot just to make everything match up. So to activate snapping, I'm going to click on this magnet icon here at the bottom. So let's just click on the magnet icon. And then here in this drop down list, I want to choose the type of snapping that I'm going to use. So select that and I want to make sure that we're using incremental snapping and select that. And that will make sure that when I move this cube, it's going to move in nice discrete increments, one world unit at a time. So I'm going to just move this up and straight away you can see now that the cube is aligned exactly to the floor. The base of this cube is aligned to the floor. But you'll see that the pivot point now is not at the world origin. It's offset from the world origin. So what I want to do is to realign the object's pivot point to the grid floor here. Now you can see I've got this sort of crosshair icon 
This represents the 3D cursor, which just marks a point in the 3D scene. By default, it's aligned to the world origin. I can actually change the position of this cursor by right-clicking anywhere in the scene to reposition the cursor. But it just so happens that I want it at the world origin. So let's set it back to the world origin. To do that, I can choose Object, Snap, and then choose Cursor to Center, and that will put the 3D cursor back to the world center here. And what I want to do is align this pivot of this object to the point where the world cursor is. So to do that, I'm going to choose Object. We have to make sure here that this box is selected in the scene. It is, and I can tell that because of the orange border painted around it. So I'm going to choose Object, Transform, and Origin to 3D Cursor. And that will align the pivot point of this object now to the 3D Cursor. So if I move this box, you can see it's still at the, the base of the cube here. So everything's aligned there nicely. We've got this pivot point at the base of the cube, and that's aligned uh, just as we want it. Uh, but what about the size of the cube? Is this the size that we want? Well, no, I don't think that this is the size that I want. Now, in Blender, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the units in Blender and the units in Unity. So we can know automatically that whatever we model in Blender, it will appear at the same size in Unity. And both of them use meters. So one world unit corresponds effectively to one meter. Now if I click on this little plus icon here at the side and I pull this out to the left, we can begin to have a look at the dimensions of the cube. You can see we have the zero position here. It's, this is location is at the world origin. Its rotation is zero, its scale is one. But here we have the dimensions of the cube and it is two by two by two. And I really want to just change those dimensions. I'm going to change it to four by four by three. And you may wonder, why those dimensions? How did I arrive at those figures? Well, I really got to these by trial and error. I would create this cube, export it into Unity, test it out, and see whether I thought it was correct. Now, um, that takes a bit of trial and error, but that's how I got to these figures. But notice that the figures are round numbers. They are not decimal numbers. So I've not used, for example, 3.15. I've used nice rounded numbers, and I recommend that you always try to keep to the nice rounded numbers wherever possible. So I'm using 4 by 4 by 3, and that's going to be the size of our base tile, which means effectively that any other tile we create should either be this size or multiples of it. So that's how we can go about positioning and sizing our base tile. So let's move further to configure our scene and our base tile. The next thing that I want to do, since we're going to be doing a lot of modeling, is that I'm not really interested in lighting. We're not going to be rendering this scene in Blender. We're going to be importing these models into Unity, and they're going to be rendered there. So I can completely remove the light in my scene. In Blender, lights are called lamps. You can see the lamp is here. Now I can select that from the viewport, or I can select it in the outliner here. So I'm going to select the lamp and press the delete key on the keyboard and confirm that I want that object removed. We don't want any lighting at all. And when I'm modeling, I'm going to be modeling in the solid shading display. You can make sure that's activated in your viewport by moving down here to this globe icon and making sure that you've got the solid display activated. So I'm going to select solid display. That is already activated. Now, of course, this is right now a cube. This is going to be, however, an environment. So we're going to have walls on the inside here. Now, if I zoom into the cube, you can see that we've got the faces are shaded on both sides. But actually, the normals are facing outwards here. So really, it's only going to be shaded on the outside. When we take this cube into Unity, only the outside faces will be shaded, and we don't actually want that. We want the interior faces to be shaded instead. So I'm going to need to flip the normals on this object. So I'll enter edit mode. I will press the tab key on the keyboard, and I will switch to face mode. I'm going to right click and choose face, or you can also select the face mode from down here. So I'm going to choose face mode. I want to select all the faces, so I'll press Control-A on the keyboard to select all of those faces. 
and to flip the normal so I can choose mesh and faces and then move up to the menu here and choose flip normals or alternatively I can press the control key on the keyboard and right click with the mouse to display the context menu and choose flip normals from the context menu. Now I flip the normals but you'll notice that nothing appears to have changed in the viewport and that is because by default Blender renders all the faces as two-sided and I want to disable that behavior. So I'm going to exit the object mode here and just open up this menu from the side and I'm going to scroll down here and open up the display tab. So I'm going to unravel the display tab, scroll down further and I want to put a check mark in back face culling so that the backs of faces are not rendered. And when I enable that, you can see now in the viewport this has changed. If I toggle it on and off, you can see the difference. I'm now viewing this cube as an observer from the outside, but I can see its interior faces because these faces have been flipped. So there we have now configured the cube to show the interior faces. The other thing that I like to do is that when I deselect this cube, really I can't see the edges marked on the cube. I like to be able to see the wireframe over the top of the shaded display. So I'm going to select the cube here and just move over here to the object data tab and scroll down so at the bottom under the display group we have these settings here and I'm going to put a tick inside wire and draw all edges like so. So now you can see even when I've not selected the cube, we're still having those edges drawn nice and neatly there and I can see all of those edges. So that's how I've now configured the base cube ready for modeling. So let's start by creating perhaps the simplest of all the pieces in the modular environment set and that is the floor piece, the center floor pieces. Now if you have a look at this model that we've already got in our base tile, you can see that really we've already got the floor piece in place which is this square floor here. It's just that we don't want the walls or the ceiling. Now I don't want to come in and start editing this base tile and making changes to this. I actually want to preserve this object intact. I want to create duplicates of it and adjust the duplicates as I need to. So what I've got here is this base tile you can see here on the layers panel is on this first layer here. We know that because of the little dots on the layer. If I select the other layers, you can see they're completely empty. And I'm going to return back to the original layer. So what I want to do is to duplicate this object, put the duplicate on a new layer, and then tweak the object as necessary to create the floor piece. So I'm going to select the base tile and press Control D on the keyboard to create the duplicate. And then just press Enter on the keyboard. And now we've got a duplicate that's in place. So I'm going to press Ctrl Z to just undo the transform there. And I want to move this duplicate to this second layer here. So to do that I can choose Object and I'm going to choose Move to Layer. And I can move it to the second layer here. And now it's been moved. You can see the dot has been added to the second layer down here. And I can jump between the two and see the different objects. So here we've got the original tile and here we have our duplicate. And I'm going to come in and start editing this object to create the floor piece. So all I really want to do for creating this floor piece is to delete the walls and the ceiling. So to do that I'm going to select the object, come into edit mode and I can draw a box select around all of these faces like so. And you see that it only selects these two closest to me. And what I want to do, let's just undo that there, what I want to do is select all of these faces that I draw a box select over. But right now it's just drawing the faces nearest to me because I'm not selecting the faces furthest from me. And I can fix that easily by coming over here and turning on limit selection to visible. I can turn that off so that now I can draw a box select over all those faces and it will also select the ones at the back. So it just hasn't selected that one there and I can select that. And we have all of those faces. So now I can press delete on the keyboard or I can scroll down here on this left hand menu and choose delete and I want to delete the faces here. So I'm going to select faces and I've deleted the faces and all we're left with now is this floor section. 
and that's really exactly how we want it. So now I've got the floor piece for our environment and this piece will tile nicely. So there we've created the floor. I'm going to jump back to the main tile, the base tile that we have and we're going to be using this to start creating the other pieces such as the walls and corners. So what I want to do in this movie is to create one of these straight section edge pieces for our modular environment. Right now you can see we've got this kind of quad floor. We have this on the second layer and we can tile and repeat this as many times as we want. But there will come a point where we want to have a wall section. And it's going to be a straight wall section. We're also going to have a corner piece that we've seen as well. But right now I just want to focus on creating the straight wall section piece that will be used to mark the edges of the floor. So let's return back to our base tile and we're going to clone in another tile. So I'm going to make sure this base tile is selected. Again it has that orange border drawn around it. And press Ctrl D on the keyboard to create a duplicate. And then I'm going to press enter on the keyboard to accept the position. This is the new position of the duplicate and again it's exactly over the top of the original cube. And I'm going to move this to the third layer here. So I'm going to select object, move to layer and select the third layer. I'm then going to jump over to that third layer so we can see that we've got this piece here. And we can come in and start modeling the floor piece from this. Now the first thing I want to do is to delete the ceiling because the modular environment we're creating is not really going to be for a first person type game. We're going to have something maybe like an isometric kind of game where the camera zoomed out here and in those sorts of games we don't need a ceiling piece at all. So I'm going to enter edit mode here by pressing tab on the keyboard and select the ceiling piece and just press delete on the keyboard and select faces to delete the ceiling face. What I want to do then really is to start modeling the wall section. Now we know that we don't need this half of the cube at all. We're just modeling one half here. But not just that. I'm going to create the wall piece but it's going to actually be based on a quad section. So I don't even need this half of the wall. I just need this quad section here. And when I want to create the other half of this floor piece, this wall piece, I'm just going to mirror this in. Uh, we'll see how that works. So let's get started at sort of chopping apart this tile. So I want to put a dividing line through the centre this way and through the centre that way. And to do that I'm going to insert some edge loops. So I'm going to press the tab key to bring this object into edit mode. And again I'm going to move over to this panel here. And you'll see that we have this tool loop, cut and slide and it allows us to insert edge loops into the model. So I'm going to choose loop cut and bring the edge loop here and click and then press enter on the keyboard. If I don't press enter on the keyboard I end up sliding the edge loop to all kinds of other places. If that happens that's okay you can just click to position the edge loop and if you want to bring that back to the center you can just move here where it says factor and I can just change that to zero to reposition that back to the center of the cube. So I've inserted one edge loop here and I want to insert another one across here. So I'm going to insert another edge loop here, press enter on the keyboard to insert that there. So now I've created this piece here and I can start removing the pieces that we don't need. So I'm going to right click and choose face mode and select all of these faces here and press delete on the keyboard to remove them. And again I'm going to come over to here and delete all of these faces as well and press delete for those faces. And I'm going to press this delete on this face too because what we're creating is a straight wall section that's going to tile all the way through here so we don't want a wall piece there. So I've got the basic structure in place for our wall section. But of course just having these two phases like this is a bit bland. We're going to want to come in and start refining this model and adding extra detail. And we're going to be doing that next. So now we've got the main wall here, the straight section sort of blocked out. We have the floor region and the wall region. You'll notice already that the model here, the pivot point, is still aligned to the world origin. 
and that's really going to help us out later on when modeling when flipping this model and rotating it if I just press E on the keyboard to move to the rotate tool and rotate this model you'll see that it hinges around that pivot point so I'm going to press Control Z to undo that here you'll also see that the dimensions of this wall are still aligned nicely to the grid so let's come in and start adding detail to this wall now the first thing I want to do is since this is going to be a sci-fi environment I'm going to have this wall maybe a little bit angular here so that it has a kind of hexagon look. So what I want to do is I'm going to select the edge mode here and select this bottom edge and press W on the keyboard to move to the translate tool and I'm just going to pull in that bottom edge to maybe about there so we've got a kind of slope on this wall here. Now what I want to do with this slope area is I want to maybe have this sloping until about the middle of the wall and then after that it's going to become a straight section for the rest of the wall. So I'm going to choose the loop cut and slide tool and move this here and just select the loop cut and slide, click on the wall and I'm going to slide this down maybe to about there and insert that edge loop so we've got that edge loop fitted there. And so this part of the wall here, this is going to be the straight section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with loop cut and slide again and I'm going to insert a second edge loop and bring it down maybe to about there like this and I'm just going to pull this edge loop inwards like so and I want to line it up exactly with the position of this edge at the top so what I can do is I can turn on snapping switch to say vertex mode then I'm going to constrain the movement of this edge on this axis here, the x-axis and as I hold it down and start to move it, I'm going to move my mouse cursor over this vertex here and it will snap the position of this edge to the x position of this vertex so now I know that this edge is exactly aligned with this edge and it's a completely straight section of wall I'm going to turn off snapping there and select edge again, I'm going to select this edge and perhaps just move it just inwards just a little bit and raise it upwards like so again I could use snapping to align this edge with this edge but I want perhaps a slight angle on this wall here like so, maybe something along those kind of lines so now we've got the angular bottom half here and this top part now I also want perhaps along the bottom a line with the floor some trim so I can create that by inserting another edge loop at the bottom here so let's bring this down maybe to about there to represent the top of the trim and then I'm going to cut this down with another edge loop here and raise it up to about there like so and then I'm going to select this edge, the top edge here and the bottom edge actually I think I'm going to select maybe this edge and then just bring this back just a bit here and just pull this down like so to create a bit of trim for the bottom of the wall I still want to keep an angle on this part of the wall and I think that's looking okay you can see now we've got some trim here at the bottom of the wall that's looking pretty good I also want some extra trim at the top of the wall here so again I'm going to enter edit mode, insert another edge loop and bring that to the top of the wall to about there and I want this to poke outwards so I'm going to move to face mode, select this face and I'm going to be extruding this outwards, I can use these different extrude tools here I'm going to press alt X on the keyboard and that will extrude out the edge along its normal so maybe to about there I think that's looking pretty good I think yeah that's about right and one thing you'll notice is that we've got, an, we've got a face here and here now we don't want these faces because when we tile this wall it's going to meet up here and we're never going to see these faces at all you might say well if we're never going to see them and it doesn't matter if you leave them there but of course when we put this into unity every single face of this model has a computational cost and we want to reduce that cost as much as possible so we can get the best performance for our game so we want to act as though every single face counts so I'm going to select this face 
and I'm going to select this face at the end here. I'm going to press the delete key on the keyboard and choose faces to remove those faces. And there we've created the sort of the basic shape of our wall section. Next I want to sort of look at the edge pieces here of the wall to see how we can make them tile nicely.